All righty. Now I have to begin with the iconic uh, tone of the famous Robin Williams. So, good morning, UUFP. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Pottstown. We are a welcoming congregation. We see value in everybody, the inherent worth and dignity that we all intrinsically have, whether we want to know it or not. We are spiritual seekers. Therefore, we are wide open. <clears throat> and in fact, we grow with the diversity <clears throat> of anybody, any gender, any position on your gender, any past religious experiences you've had, given Jewish, Catholic, um, Hindu, we don't care. We welcome you because it's your diversity to bring to us that helps us grow in our spiritual journey with each other. And as long as we respect each other, which is the golden rule, then you are a part of us and we welcome you. We welcome newcomers, we welcome old comers, we welcome everybody. We're also um, going to have a guest speaker who is sitting to my right, Jerry Lazaro, who's been with us before. Uh, his topic is Rock of Ages, which brought me back to my Jewish roots where he actually sang the song in Hebrew, which has been translated to English, Rock of Ages. Said it for me. So, uh, so it was near and dear to my heart, but I know we're going in a different direction, as is often our way of thinking um, in this fellowship. So it is now time for any uh, announcements for the benefit of the fellowship. Um, we can rearrange that mic if anybody wants to come up, uh, and Jerry will put it back for his guitar playing. Sit. Yes, it was. I'm um, I have an announcement next Saturday. We're going to have a work party service. What will be the, the song sign? Finally, um, ten to one, ten to one, and there's lots of other stuff to do other than the sign. Please. <laughs> Uh, you may or may not have noticed that in the corner of the uh, social hall, I set up a little stand with reed hearts in there. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're all handmade, some by me and some by previous members of UF, UFP. And um, I have a suggestion donation on the back, plus what it says inside the card, whether it's blank or it has a saying in it. And then I just put envelopes there in an attempt to keep track of um, the much we're making with the fundraiser. But in the fundraiser, and all of Parts there, um, money for yeah, the girls, right? You know what I mean? Um, so if anybody puts a birthday card or um, whatever, they're in there, and um, I'm going to keep replenishing it. Morning, I'm Valerie. I'm very related to that. I'm organizing, first of all, I hope will be an annual uh, craft raffle to benefit the church. So throughout the month of uh, October, I am looking for donations. If you are an artist or a crafter of any kind, photographer, painter, knitter, crocheter, if you quilt, <clears throat> paper crafts like Erica, anything like that, I would love to donate something uh, to the craft raffle, and then we'll have those things on display starting in November. Okay, so we thank everyone for their announcements. We often begin with a chime. That is a way of delineating the kind of the secular time where we make announcements to the time we want everyone to focus. Turn off. Do I have another announcement? Solution. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the chime kind of gets us hopefully into a mental space preparing for worship. We would ask you, as a result, if you turn off uh, things that make noise, cagers, phones, please put them on silent mode, 
vibration will be sufficient to alert you and we won't interrupt the service. So take a deep breath and become present in the area. says this rings a lot longer than you think. It's fascinating just to focus on this. It's still making noise even after a long time. So without any further ado, I welcome Jerry Lazaro, the basis with his presence and his wisdom and knowledge, and we look forward to his comments. Morning. Uh, let me add my warmest welcome to John's this morning. And uh, to express my deepest appreciation and pleasure to again the worship here at UUFP. And we begin worship this morning with an adaptation of United by Story and Bound by Love, opening words by transgender author, poet, artist, and photographer, Reverend Andrea Hawkins Camper. Gather me now into this space, this time when the wheel turns and the wheel shatters. Gather we now to wonder, to remember, to complete our harvests before the long dark comes. Gather we now to tell the old stories and sing the old songs, to be as we have always been, the voice of our people eternal. Gather we now to celebrate that which was, that which is, and that which will be. Gather we now, as we have always done, united by story and bound by love. So whoever you are, wherever you may be on your spiritual journey, whatever you must in conscience truly responsibly believe, however you identify or express your gender, whomever you love, we welcome you and invite you to worship with us this hour, united by story, what I think is the greatest story finally beginning to be told, and bound by love. Now it's time, I think, to light our chalice. Do we have some assistance here in lighting the chalice? Yes, would you help us with this? We know the chalice and the flame together symbolize our Unitarian Universalist faith. They signify, among many things, our openness to the wisdom of many ages and many traditions, including humanist and scientific traditions, and a steadfast commitment to keep the light of truth, the warmth of compassion, and the fire, the flame of liberty and justice burning within ourselves and throughout our world. We light our chalice with words crafted for this occasion. May this small flame we now kindle remind us of the five billion year story of light and the fiery furnaces shaping our world and worlds without end. May it remind us of stars, the furnaces of creation, where the elements of our universe are formed and transformed and ultimately disseminated into the vastness of space-time. May it remind us of the furnaces burning deep within our Earth, where the wonderfully diverse shapes, colors, and textures we see and touch on this thin shell of our planet home are formed and transformed. May it remind us of hearth fires around which our ancestors gathered, around which we still gather today to warm our bodies, to break bread, to share stories, and to forge the bonds of kinship and community. And I think we should start with an opening hymn, no? Uh, Lisa said, we read live music, so I did bring the guitar, and I'll do my best to accompany us, lead us in singing uh, hymn number 40, The Morning Hangs the Signal. Uh, the words were written by William Channing Garrett, Gannett, one of the most prominent Unitarian Universalist ministers of the 19th and early 20th centuries. And the words are set to a tune by Welsh composer William Lloyd. It's a tune so often used in musical settings that it has its own name, which I think you would pronounce in Welsh as Marionis. <laughs> Even the Welsh can't pronounce Welsh, so I'm, I don't feel bad. <laughs> You turn this all over here, I'll turn it over. Yeah. Let's see. Let's get it down here. Good catch. 
Yeah, you could say a good sleep. Whether like this, the strings of a guitar are particularly <laughs> sensitive. I tuned it up two minutes ago and it died was wet really. Okay. The morning hangs a signal, hymn number 40. It's in our hymnal. The words are up there. If you'd like to stand as willing and able. And I'll play it through once and then we'll sing it. some of our uh, younger youths here, and uh, I do have a little thing planned here, it's time for all ages, it truly is a time for all ages, but if the uh, youngest would like to come forward um, and take a seat around here, let's see what we can do. There we go. And uh, did anyone bring any rocks or stones with yeah. us? Yeah. Okay, good enough. It's on, right? Good. Okay. Um, so what did you bring? Oh, look at these. Can I show, can, do you want to show them to everyone? Say if I show them to everyone. Stand over here. Now, that is a rock that you created some artwork out of, right? Okay. Where did you find the rock? Outside? In your own yard? or? your own feet, right? Yeah. But this rock, you just picked up as it is. Do you know what it is? Let me take a look. I'm going to make a guess here that this is either nice or schist, is what it would be called. Okay? It's a rock that started out as something else, and then because it was deep in the earth's crust, 
and it was hot, and there was a lot of pressure on it, it changed the minerals in the rock so that you have these bands going through here and that part right there. Did you ever think, wow, that's, that's a neat rock, that, that when you're out like walking in the woods or anything like that, you notice the trees and the flowers and the, and the, and the animals, right? Do you ever look un under your feet, though, and think, what am I walking on? What's under there? What is it? Do you know, for example, that underlying this entire property here and all of the land that goes around us for miles is composed of a rock called shale. And in fact, it's so closely associated with this area that it has the name the Pottstown Shale. <laughs> so you are the Unitary Universalist Fellowship of the Pottstown Shale. <laughs> okay. And, and do you know how shale is made? Probably not, right? Okay. Well, what happens is that you have mountains, right? And over time, water and wind and freezing and thawing breaks up the rocks in those mountains into little tiny particles. And the water carries it into rivers and lakes. And over time, it settles into the, into the bottom of the lake and the river. And it gets buried and buried and buried. And all that pressure on it winds up making it hard. And that's what shale is. And it's amazing to me because most people don't really look very much <coughs> under their feet. So, and you walk by something. So if you saw something like this lying on the ground, what would you think? It's, it's kind of like a color. It has a bluish color and so forth, you know. But... You wouldn't think too much of it, but you know what? If you cut this rock open, you know what you're going to find? This. This is a rock called a geode. And you may have heard of geodes. And this one doesn't have a lot done to it, so the colors are not as bright. But sometimes humans will take a geode and decide to polish it up even more and put even more color in it, you wind up with something that looks like that. <laughs> see, and see, what's in there are these crystals, right? It started out, it's just a round rock, but water seeped into it, and the water broke down some of the minerals and formed crystals, and depending upon what was in the rock, whether it was iron or some other kind of rock, it'll pick up the color. That's kind of neat, isn't it? Yeah. Those are geodes. Now, what, I ask you a question. Do you ever think, gee, I, I, I want to go deeper when I take a walk. I want to go down. I want to figure, what am I standing on? What's, what's below me? And how did they get there? <laughs> what is that? Well, for a billion years, people didn't know. They don't know. What happens, for example, you know, and we think of all this ground we're on as really solid, right? And, and uh, But it isn't necessarily. And it has changed so much. Do you know that this land that we're on here was once under sea water? Yep. This was part of a shallow sea. And guess where it was? <laughs> you know, you've seen a globe, right? And around the center of the globe is what we call the equator, right? The divides Earth and half. That this land was actually south of the equator. And over time, the, the movement of the big plates that make up our firm Earth here shifted and came all the way up north to where we are today. You know, this blows my mind. I really, I, I, it really does. See, ever since I took geology in college, I had rocks in my head. And I haven't been able to get rid of them. They're always there, and I'm always going to say, what is it about this one? Where did it come from? How did it get here? How is it made? How, how is it made? And what's going to happen to it? 
It's great. In fact, as I was driving up here along Route 422, the uh, banks along the road, in many cases, are composed of red shale, right? And sometimes it's kind of smooth and heavy, but other times there are big chunks of it because water, wind, freezing, and thawing, right, have broken up that shale. And now there are big plates of shale sitting, sitting on the side of the road and, and along the bank. And what's going to happen to it eventually? It'll crumble and turn into little tiny specks, and it'll be carried somewhere, and it'll be deposited, and it will become another rock someday. What is my mind? Now, I have something for you guys. I don't know if you want to buy this, but this is what a geode actually looks like. Okay. If you saw it, Laying on the ground, it would look something like this. And I don't know, I, I was, I thought you'd take it back to your classes, but I'm a little concerned because you got to be careful. Because when we do this, we don't want little pieces of rock to fly and hit somebody in the eye. So you would always like to put something like this on, okay? put on these safety goggles. Like this, right? And I'm gonna get one of these. I'm gonna put this here, and we're gonna see if we can do something different. We're gonna take it. Let's see if we can break <laughs> out. Okay. All right. Oh, it's hard. <laughs> now, see, this one doesn't have two, but you can see the crystals that are in it, right? Yeah. Now, and because this was actually the the rock that was in there was pretty much just a quartzite rock that was white, so it didn't have a lot of color. But there could have been other stones in there that, that, that had color, and that would wind up more like that. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the guys this you can take it back to your class and at some point if you want and actually with one of your teachers try this but don't forget I'm gonna put the glass in. and another thing you can do just in case is you want to make sure that no fragments fall out you can put the rock in a sock like this put it on there and then break it open and that way no no little fragments could fly out and hurt anyone. Okay, so we're going to send you folks, we're going to send you folks off to your classes, right? And I want you to take, who's going to take this? Okay, all right, okay. Go now in peace, go now in peace. I think that's evident to get all this stuff and get it out of the board. Get my little friends here. I'll put them up here. What do you think? <laughs> As I said, I, I, I. <laughs> I took a course in geology because somebody said, oh, this professor's really good and, you know, it's a lot of fun. And I took it. And um, I'm not going to tell you the, the, the binding way that I took, but I wound up taking then a second course. And then uh, after I transferred to Temple University, I took the course. And then I liked the professor so much that I wound up taking an advanced course in stratigraphy and sedimentation. What I found out pretty soon when I got into class was 
that this was not for just people who wanted to dabble in geology uh, <laughs> or for the faint hearted. Half of the students in there were graduate students who had been told, listen, if you want to have a snowball's chance in hell of passing this guy's graduate course, you better have taken his undergraduate course. <laughs> Our class project was to reconstruct the geologic history of Pennsylvania. And as you know, geologic history of Pennsylvania, as I gave a little of that, has a very, very, very complex history, uh, geologic history. It was, it was quite an experience. And as I said, once I got those rocks in my head, I couldn't get rid of them. And uh, you'll hear a little bit more about that in a moment. But I think now we should uh, accept our offering. And as we accept the offering this morning, let's keep in mind the words of Reverend John Saxon. This religious community exists by its mission as a fire exists by burning. But a fire cannot burn without fuel. Your support, the free and generous support of each member and friend of this community, is what fuels this community and its mission. And without your support, the flame of justice, community, and love cannot burn brightly to warm us and to be a beacon in a world threatened by division and fear. And I believe Kate Price is going to write a rendition of the Rock of standard hymn, Rock of Ages. <laughs> Our responsive reading this morning is from Hollering Sun, a children's work by poet, author, and photographer Nancy Wood, who passed away in 2013 at the age of 76. A deep spirituality infuses her work, inspired by her experience of the American Southwest and the culture and history of Native American peoples. This excerpt, My Help is in the Mountain, is her riff on the well-known opening passage from Old Testament Psalm 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made heavens and earth. Wood's recasting of Psalm 121 provides how you could express the full experience of your connection with the mountain can provide, actually, shelter and comfort to the soul. Her variation resonates with me on a very deeply personal level, but beyond that, I think her variation is a very Unitarian, Universalist version of Psalm 21. It's a version that fully assimilates and embraces our commitment to affirm and promote respect for the interdependent web of existence of which we are a part. Um, you, I'll have you read the, the lines in italics. My help is in the mountain, where I take myself to heal the earthly wounds that people gave to me. So I must stay for a long time until I have grown from the rock. Then I know that nothing touches me, nor makes me run away. My help is in the mountain that I take away with me. Now, how many of you uh, here today were ever part of a Christian faith community? 
uh, were two of the hymns you sang on many a Sunday morning, Christ has made the sure foundation and Rock of Ages, which uh, Kay just played for us. If Christ has made the sure foundation, you'd proclaim that the rock on which your faith rests is Jesus Christ. Christ has made the sure foundation, Christ the head and cornerstone. And in Rock of Ages, you'd profess that your only refuge from depravity and damnation is Jesus Christ. Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from my wounded side which flow be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Now, I mention these hymns because they feature such a prominent metaphor in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the tradition from which we Unitarian Universalists descended. Fundamental Christians would say, we descended all right, descended all the way to the depths of hell, but that's another story. I like to think we actually ascended from the Judeo-Christian tradition. And I can tell you that this UU, at least, found geology, or more precisely, geological science, and the geological view of the world to provide stepping stones to another level of consciousness and spiritual awakening. But I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here. Uh, but the prominent metaphor in the Judeo-Christian tradition I'm referring to is, of course, figures of speech involving stones and rocks and their many manifestations, crystals, precious metals, hills, mountains. These often serve as symbols of gods and of places where the God's presence is most strongly felt. For example, in Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Old Testament of the Bible, which really is the kind of basis for the Rock of Ages, that God is referred to as the rock, a flawless rock at that. He is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. And in Psalm 121, recast by Nancy Ward in our responsive reading, the hills are the source of divine aid and comfort in the face of adversity. I will lift mine eyes unto the hills from whence my help cometh. It's a funny story one time. I, I officiated soccer for about 25 years, and I was sent to a field, and the guy who was supposed to be with me didn't show up. I, when you're trying to follow a bunch of 18 testosterone-charged year olds, right, you know, up and down a field of, of 100 yards, you can get there. And I just remember, and the field was at the bottom of a hill, and the spectators were up on the hill, and I looked up, and that's why the oh, Please, I need help from the mountain. Come on. Uh, the, the guy who was supposed to come was actually a, a, a Presbyterian minister. Anyway, think of the profound significance of the rock metaphor in the book of Matthew in the New Testament, chapter 16, verse 18. After hearing the apostle Simon bar Jonah profess his faith, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth proclaims, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. You've heard this before, right? and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the renaming of the apostle is, of course, a play on the word Petrus, which is the Latin word for rock, two S Petrus. And the renaming of the rock is Jesus' pronouncement of, of the foundation upon which the church is to rest. And the meaning of this pronouncement turned out to be of great consequence in the history of Western civilization, didn't it? It was interpreted by the Catholic Church to declare the supreme ecclesiastical authority of Peter, the Bishop of Rome, and all the bishops of Rome that succeeded him, that is, the popes, right? And we all know the part that papal authority and power played in Western history and culture, and how it was the center of power struggles and wars in Europe for centuries how it became the primary mover in the Protestant Reformation. Remember, the Anglican Church, the Church of England, was formed when Pope Clement VII in 1527 refused to annul King Henry VIII's marriage to Catherine of Aragon. Henry was determined to ditch the childless Catherine and marry his paramour Anne Boleyn, right? So Henry, who had once been dubbed by the Pope defender of the Roman Catholic faith, broke with Rome, 
and founded a religion that rejected the supreme authority of the Pope. And all of the Protestant denominations in the world today reject the idea that the Pope is the supreme arbiter of God's will on earth. It's not the rock upon which their church, that is their brand of religion, is based. But rocks and for rock formations are not only prominent in the Judeo-Christian traditions, but in all world religions. Mount Fuji in Japan has sacred status and significance in the Shinto religion. The Himalaya mountains are sacred to Buddhists. Native Americans saw configurations and colors of stone as holy places, places where the great spirit more powerfully, and pardon the pun, concretely expressed itself, right? To this day, spiritualists and naturalist traditions, right, claim that certain crystals nurture and heal the spirit. Quartz, one of the minerals in the geode, is composed of one part silicone bound with two parts oxygen. And silicates are the two most abundant minerals in the Earth's crust. Yet, as Denise Brandenburg writes on the web site Sciencing, quote, in spiritual cultures, quartz is one of the most commonly used minerals for spiritual attunement and cleansing. It's not rare. It really doesn't have much monetary value, but it's very important. And consider the structures that we humans fashion of rock and stone, not only to express religious beliefs, but to create holy places and spaces for religious practice. The 3,100-year-old monoliths of Stonehenge, to the 500 to 1,000-year-old Easter Island Moai, from the rock and sand gardens of Buddhist monasteries to the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. From Michelangelo's sculpture, La Madonna della Pietà, simply the Pietà, right? To the messages on pebbles that the youth of the Thomas Paine Fellowship, I have here, or something, they wrote little messages on them, right? And they left it for people to take with them, justice, kindness, Things like that, right? But let's dig a little deeper here. Listen, I'm not going to apologize for puns anymore because I just can't open so <laughs> Beyond the use of rock and rock metaphor in any religious tradition, rock is universally applied to give tangible sensory form to something deep in our human psyche. The yearning for something solid, something permanent in our lives, in our world. As Bertrand Russell wrote in A History of Western Philosophy, quote, the search for something permanent is one of the deepest of the instincts leading to philosophy. And we could certainly tack on the phrase leading to religion, too. Rock symbolize our search for stability and permanence and the idea that something firm and enduring supports our cherished beliefs. What we believe in and on and what we worship in should be rock solid. What we cherish should be able, like rock, to stand the test of time. Now, I understand why our ancestors found rock the ideal metaphor for something solid and permanent, because they had no notion just how much the earth had changed and was still changing. Right? It changes through cataclysmic events like earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, but also continuously, every second of every day, through tectonic movement, through chemical and physical weathering, and yes, through the appearance and the persistence of biological life on Earth. Trees, flowers, animals all play a part in changing the composition and appearance of our planet. Life on Earth, the biosphere, significantly impacts Earth's composition and appearance, the lithosphere, and the lithosphere impacts the air we breathe, the atmosphere. Plants, having mastered that amazing process of photosynthesis, ex exponentially increase the amount of oxygen in the earth as well as in the, in the sky. Oil, coal, and limestone formed from the decomposed remains of plant and animal life are part of our landscape and part of our economy. 
Plastic, <clears throat> an oil byproduct created by humans, now litters land and water. And elevated levels of carbon dioxide and air and water result from the accelerated pace of fossil fuel extraction and combustion. By that very recent arrival in Earth's biosphere, us, <laughs> you homo sapiens. And our ancestors understood little how rocks form, how they're transformed, and how old they truly are relative to the age of the Earth and the cosmos. Wise as they may have been, the ancients lacked the methods and technologies to decipher what, this, what they saw around them. They hadn't accumulated enough empirical data to recount a, a credible story of how Earth came to appear as it appeared to them. So in place of that accumulated data, they created myths of creation and fables to account for what they saw. So, stories of how some mythical person was turned by the gods into a tree, a flower, a rock. Narcissus, right? Uh, that turned into the flower that we call Narcissus. They couldn't possibly know or even imagine the origin and substance of rocks as we know them to be today. They couldn't conceive that rocks trace their ancestry to minerals forged in stars. And they could never have imagined that we owe our creation and our continued existence to those minerals and how they assemble in the rocks. The Judeo-Christian myth that a God created the first human out of clay was a primitive step in that direction, but that's about all you could say, right? How could they know, how could they know that our bones, rich in calcium and phosphate, do indeed link us to rocks and ultimately to the stars which manufactured the elements that form the rocks of the ages. How could they know that carbonaceous chondrites, meteors containing the building blocks of organic, chemicals, carbon, sugar, and prototypes of amino acids, how could they know that they were responsible for creating life on Earth? That said, even for us today, rocks and hills and mountains offer images of stability and permanence in a world in which change and the pace of change just seems overwhelming. But this image of stability and permanence is an illusion, right? The more we learn about our planet, the more we learn about its constant turbulence, the more we confirm the conclusion of the Greek philosophers, the only thing permanent is change. Now, far from being disillusioned and deflated by that awareness, I personally feel enriched and empowered by it. <laughs> I've, as I said, I've had rocks in my head ever since I was introduced to geologic science in college. Nothing I see on a walk in the park or a hike through the woods or a climb up a mountain seems unworthy of notice or interest. A rock outcrop, a boulder, a mundane block of sandstone, a dingy gray sheet of shale, a slab of common granite, challenges me, intrigues me. It unleashes my imagination. I have to envision how it came to be and what will happen to it as the forces that sculpted our planet in the past continue their work through the present and into the unforeseeable future. Rocks literally deepened my appreciation of the natural world. And they also challenged me to think of time in terms of billions of years. The 4.6 billion years our Earth has existed, let alone the over 15 billion year history of our universe. I can't wrap my head around the fact that I've lived in the same house now for 26 years. Right? I, 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 I'm having trouble with that, right? Every rock and the pieces of rock we call stones is a chapter in the greatest story being told. Can we stretch our minds wide enough to conceive of incredible forces of heat and light and the continual subtle forces of erosion that create what we see? Can we, can we envision imperceptibly slow movements at microscopic levels, as well as movements occurring so rapidly and so massively that their energy exceeds by hundreds of times an atomic bomb? I'm awed by the connections between the chemistry of stars and the composition of planets, 
I'm intrigued by the incredible diversity of the natural world and the forces that shape that will continue to shape this planet and this universe. I sense greater possibilities in the interconnected web of all existence, animal, vegetable, and mineral, not just the web of biological life, which in itself, of course, is mind-boggling. I can see and touch objects that, right, that inspire awe and wonder without having to invoke divine machinations or magical thinking, right? All I have to do is project onto the past and into the future the very processes that are happening right now under my feet and above my head, here, now, today, and millions of light years away as well. And the story of the Earth we can now construct through the expansion of our senses, we call technology, continues to expand and evolve. I mentioned earlier that um, oxygen and silicone are the most common. Oh, did I mention that? They're the most common elements on Earth? Yeah. Okay. On Earth's crust. Uh -huh. But we now know that silicate minerals are the most common elements within the Earth as well. Tech, the technology developed to extract minerals from the Earth's crust and to predict and measure earthquakes allows us to measure and analyze what lies hundreds of miles beneath the Earth's crust, deep in the Earth's mantle. In 2014, this is only 10 years ago, geologists determined that Earth's most abundant mineral is a silicate rock akin to quartz, but which contains magnesium and less frequently iron. It was named Bridgmanite after Percy Bridgman. He was a physicist who won a Nobel Prize in 1946 for his work on the effects of high pressure, pressure on matter. And why the name? Because Bridgmanite can only form under high temperature and pressure conditions, conditions that occur, for example, when celestial bodies collide. And the mineral was first detected in meteorites. And Defining the composition and the properties of those meteoric rocks led to the discovery that this same silicate rock forms a thick bed circling the Earth hundreds of miles below its surface. So for now at least, stay tuned, right? Bridgmanite MgSiO3, one magnesium with one silicone and three oxygen, reigns as the Earth's most common mineral. It comprises 38% almost two-fifths of our Earth. And a mineral dubbed ringwoodite, another silicate rock, first identified in a meteorite, this time in Australia, in 1969, has been confirmed as comprising another layer of Earth's mantle. The remarkable feature of woodmanite, Mg2SiO4, to, to magnesium's one silicone and four oxygens, is that it's porous and it absorbs water like a sponge. The most recent scientific studies postulate that this sponge-like ring of ringwoodite, hundreds of miles below the surface of the Earth, holds more water than all the oceans on Earth's surface. Probably three times as much. All right, now, before I say another word, I, I have to issue a disclaimer. You know, the, the one you hear when you tune into a TV talk show, you know, the opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the station or the network. That is, what I'm going to say is personal. It's not corporate. I don't pretend to speak on behalf of our UU denomination or of this fellowship or the Thomas Bain Fellowship, whatever, right? But here it goes. Let me repeat something I said earlier. I think we ascended from the Judeo-Christian tradition and that geology, or more precisely, geological thinking, provides stepping stones to another level of consciousness and spiritual awakening. I find the actual rocks of ages a surer foundation for spiritual awareness and growth than the biblical rock of ages. Why? Because rocks are real. <laughs> they are tangible reliquaries of Earth's history. To me, the greatest story ever told is the one that's still being told, 
the one occurring every inch, every day, right under our feet. It's a magnificent, mind-boggling story that sometimes yields drama, a volcanic eruption that buries an ancient Roman city and all its inhabitants, Pompeii, or one that creates a new landmass in the Icelandic Sea. You know, uh, I, was, I was in high school when the island of Circe was formed from a volcano, a volcano that was just under the sea level, which erupted, and as the lava hit the water, it hardened, and now there's an island called Circe in the Icelandic Sea. It did not exist when I was born. I, I, <laughs> or maybe it's an earthquake in the Pacific Ocean that creates a tsunami, a massive tidal wave that kills thousands and disables a nuclear power facility and creates unprecedented radioactive pollution. But more often than not, it's just the steady work of water, wind, heat, and coal that over millions of years produces a geode and also carves out a Grand Canyon. So always, always, every rock, every stone tells a story. The story that can evoke awe and wonder. And all in wonder, I believe, as with just about all the really good theologians I've read, <laughs> are the deepest source of spiritual awakening and growth. They're the catalyst of the religious impulse. For me, the rocks of ages and the minerals they contain provide a compelling story that leads me to embrace the greatest truths. Truth is, we are literally the offspring and the stuff of stars. Stars forge the carbon molecules that make life on Earth possible. And we can thank our lucky stars for minerals like magnesium, the ninth most common element in the universe, and element in Bridgmanite and Greenwood. Aging stars fuse three helium nuclei with one carbon nuclei to create magnesium. And why do sport and energy drinks contain magnesium? Because it is essential in over 300 biochemical reactions in the human body, including muscle contraction and nerve transmission. You can't run without it. You can't, in fact, you can't sit stand walk oh, without it. And the truth is, we've been given the greatest gift imaginable. We, little specks of dust in the cosmos, right? have been given what amounts to the blink of an eye in the great scheme of things to witness the greatest story being told, the birth and evolution of the universe. We are here, Annie Dillard reminds us, to abet creation, so creation need not play to an empty house. The rocks of ages are the tangible, ubiquitous reminders of how privileged we are and how grateful we should be to have the capacity to bear witness to the created world to listen to the stories the stones tell us. The rocks and the minerals that compose them remind us also that we're not the center of the universe, nor are we any match for the forces that create the world. We can't hold back volcanoes. We can't step, stop tectonic shift, right? Those poor people in California who build houses, right, and that are now just crumbling because the plates have moved so much that the houses are just falling down. Our powers of comprehension and the knowledge we possess are limited. We know what passes. We know what will pass. And indisputably, they tell us that we're part of something so much greater than ourselves. We're part and parcel of the interdependent web of all existence, animal, vegetable, and mineral. Geologist Marcia Mjellerwood eloquently expresses this sentiment in the preface to her recently published book, back in 2024, Turning to Stone, Discovering the Subtle Wisdom of Rocks. I quote, learning to read the storyline of Earth's history directly from rocks can help to provide a feeling of embeddedness in the cosmos, the sense of continuity and kinship with past and future. Perhaps the most distinctive characteristic of geological thinking is the practice of roaming across many scales in space and time. In doing so, we can see ourselves in miniature, part of a long lineage of creatures on a creative planet that has renewed itself for more than four billion years while keeping an idiosyncratic diary 
of activities over time in the form of rocks. And Bjornlund believes, and I wholeheartedly agree, that thinking like a geologist leads us not only to a sense of our connectedness to the world, but also to a deeply felt sense of stewardship for the Earth and for its creatures whose existence, let's face it, is fundamentally precarious, unpredictable, and temporary. One of Bjornlund's earlier works is in fact titled Timefulness, How Thinking Like a Geologist, think, excuse me, How Thinking Like a Geologist Can Help Save the World. And listening to the stories of land and sea and sky is humbling as well. It's ennobling, but it's also humbling. Maria Popova expresses this paradox. Every rock we touch is an emissary of time scales we cannot begin to comprehend without confronting our own transience. And yet radiating from it is also the quiet assurance that the world goes on and on, that we are part of something vast and magnificent, that beneath all the tumult and turmoil of our human lives, there is a steadfast continuity that anchors life to eternity. Every stone is a story. The stories rocks relate to us are eons older than our personal stories, than the story of our species. Of all species we share the earth with. They provide tangible proof that the only thing permanent is change. And if we are to survive, let alone thrive as a species, we must prepare for change and be resilient enough to adapt to it. And we would certainly do well to avoid narcissistic, anthropocentric ways of being in the world. That is, human-centered ways of being in the world. And instead, embrace the virtue of stewardship for our marvelous blue and green planet. God's help us as we come to terms with the increasingly obvious effects of climate change the more than 60 deaths resulting from Hurricane Helene, which is just the latest of the more frequent and more devastating hurricanes to hit the US. How about the houses collapsing along North Carolina's outer banks as sea levels rise? They put them on pylons, right, in the sand. Well, the water's just like washing the sand away from the pylons. And House just tips over and washes out the sea. We would do well to adopt the humility and reverence of poet and environmental activist Wendell Berry. Are you familiar with him? He's a wonderful, wonderful writer. We must learn to acknowledge, Berry writes, that creation is full of mystery, that we will never entirely understand it. And furthermore, that we must abandon arrogance and stand in awe. We must recover the sense of the majesty of creation and the ability to be worshipful in its presence. For I do not doubt that it is only on the condition of humility and reverence before the world that our species will be able to remain in it. So, so be it an amen. Or should I say, so be attentive to the stories beneath your feet. They inspire the ennobling and humbling awe and wonder that opens the mind and touches the heart and also feeds the spirit. Let's see, where are the other series? We have discussion and sharing of joys and sorrows. Coming up? Okay. Um, did anyone else bring a lot? <laughs> you do. <know? laughs> What did you bring? What did you bring us? This is a uh, piece of lava from Iceland. <laughs> and sister and goddaughter to Iceland in 2017 for his 60th birthday. So you clap for that. Uh, this is from a lava peel, the, earth, the volcano that erupted in 2017. 2017. That wiped out. Travel and all that. This is from that lava field. I don't know if it's from the actual volcano, but I think there are two or three around there. So it was pretty amazing. We took a, a guided tour of parts of Iceland and I asked the guy, is it okay to take some of the lava rocks? Like in Hawaii, you get, you know, the Hawaiian gods kill you for taking lava rocks. He said, well, I don't know about that here, 
you're really not supposed to, but I'm going to turn away and you do whatever you want. So this is a big piece, and I've got like three or four little ones. <laughs> and it sits out on our deck, so when I'm outside, I can see it all. And that's what the island of Circe, who was created in 1963, is made of. This is a piece of lava from Iceland. <laughs> Kay and I went there, I guess, 15 years, 10 years ago. And it's an amazing place. The crust is very thin. In some places, the crust is moving apart. And there's like a, a ditch. And all kinds of steam and fumaroles are coming. An amazing place. Anyone else? Okay. Here we are. A couple of plus. Go ahead. A couple of things. Good job. That we're concerned with. A um, couple of things. Any of you who have watched um, this old house, I think Jerry, there's a guy who's a landscaper who was called Count Rockula. So uh, I bequeath you the name of Count Rockula. The second is uh, I graduated from Dartmouth, and the Dartmouth alma mater, <clears throat> the last line is uh, about having the granite of New Hampshire in their muscles and their brains. Um, that could be good or bad. Uh, some people think we're all rockheads. The third is uh, if you go to Genesis, we remember, remember that uh, Lot's wife looked back and became either salt or rock, as the case may be. And I was doing a little quick research, and I guess the implication is in life, don't look back, but move forward, because looking back causes problems. And the final, and uh, Chad will appreciate this being an English teacher, there's a book I came across, which I just begun to read, called Eruption, any of you who like thrillers. It's an interesting book, because we all know about Michael Crichton and his fame, uh, but he passed away, and he was writing down the beginnings of the book, but never completed before his untimely death. So his wife bequeathed the book to another very well-known author, James Patterson, who has finished the book. And so I've only begun on the 30th page. It reports that the Big Island of Hawaii, which has Mauna Loa and another volcano, is about to blow to pieces. And of course, the Hawaiian Islands, as Jerry knows, are all volcanic uh, pieces. Uh, so just a thought about rocks and eruptions. Anyone else want to agree with them? Not that, uh, John. Uh, uh, who will introduce Joyce and Sorrows? Um, I guess you do. I was hoping we could enjoy Sorrows. So we use a microphone I'm holding in my hand because this is going to cause a lot of static. This is a time for Joyce and concerns. Anything that is very important that you share with us, whether it's happiness or sadness, we believe that set sharing in the sanctuary and amongst all of us carries with it some curative and beneficial power in our faith. So please come forward if you wish to do so.
or chalice. Thank you. Yes. Oh. We extinguish our chalice, but not in the light of truth, the warmth of compassion, or the fire of Fire of These two things are the Thank you. Good morning. I'm not. Uh, I was raised Jewish. 